Hey, wait, you're looking. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> you're you're listening, listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. From WNYC. Yeah. And NPR. So, uh, Jet, mm-hmm. have you ever wondered what it would be like to be a bat or a rabbit or me? <laughs> me closer to you than the bat or the rabbit? Because I, I, you couldn't really ever know what it would be like to be a bat, right? Because that, that's or you, just, for that matter. That's true. You could never, because I never am completely sure what it would be like to be you, obviously. Yeah. But uh, uh, there is a whole category in human experience called things not only that you can't know but things you kind of know you can't know the known unknowns the known unknowns things you know you can't know but really really want to yeah which is the name of our show things you know but can't know parentheses but but really 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 want want to to. that's what we're going to do this hour we're going to try to know the things that we know we can't know but want to and maybe we'll know a little bit more than we know right now later So our first story comes from our producer, Tim Howard. It has to do with one of the all-time great known unknowns, which is, what does another person feel when they're feeling pain? How do you know what that person is feeling? Pain, pain, basically. That's what it's about. Bring it on. Here's Tim. Uh, well, hi, hey, come on hey, in. How you doing? I got started with all this when I met yeah. this guy. Yeah, I'm Justin Schmidt. I'm a research biologist. But he's really a bug guy. I like to try to get into the head of... The stinging insect. He lives in in Tucson, Arizona, and um, works in this one-story building on a residential street. Right now, we're in in my laboratory at Southwestern Biological Institute. Could we could we just uh, take a quick like glance around? Yeah. Underneath those cabinets are forty-eight drawers of insect specimens. So these are. Oh, wow. He's got wasps. That's a poika. And it's a nocturnal wasp. That's terrifying, this one here. Different kinds of weird... What is this guy? Hornets. Well, that's actually a, a flightless grasshopper. He's got a lot of ants. Wow, there's some little furry... Yeah, those are velvet ants. They're huge. If you pick up one of these things and get stung by, it's going to feel like, Oh my goodness, that could kill a cow! Okay, so this all started for Justin back in the 70s, when he was a grad student. And I just thought for a lark... I took a seminar course in entomology. We we had one entomologist in the whole university. This is a course in bug science? Yeah. This was in Georgia, and he was outside one day in the field, and he was trying to get a sample of... Um, a harvester ant. A harvester ant. Well, what does that look like? They're about a third of an inch long, and they're bright red. Pretty good-sized ants, actually. And he was trying to get one into a jar, and uh, I got stung by one. And I... I kind of, I don't know, it's odd. It didn't really hurt at first. Okay, it sort of felt like somebody was using a dental uh, syringe, a really fine needle, slowly injecting a little bit of water. It had this kind of crystalline feeling. It wasn't an immediate pain. This was a delayed thing. And so then I thought, oh, okay. But after about a minute, it started really. It's like, oh, this really hurts. It's this really deep sort of visceral pain. Something was going in and tearing out your nerves and your muscles and your tendons. What struck me was how dramatically different this was from anything that I'd experienced from a bumblebee, honeybee, sweat bee, yellow jacket, paper wasp. And once the pain subsided, he thought, man, I need to study that. Yeah. You know, he had all these kind of higher level science questions about, you know, evolution of pain in insects and how different stinging insects develops. But the problem was, oh, okay, pain. What do we do about measuring pain? If he was really going to get to the bottom of why one insect was more or less painful than another, he couldn't do that with just words like more or less. I need numbers. 
With numbers, he could do all kinds of research. Not to mention it would make working with other bug scientists just a lot easier. And I started looking into this and found out, oh, this wasn't anything new. Nobody really knows how to measure pain because... You know, no two people feel pain the same way. Some people have higher pain tolerance than others. On the other hand, that harvester ant was objectively way more painful than anything he'd ever been stung by. Oh, yeah. So Justin realized what I need is a universal insect sting pain scale. So Justin starts traveling all around the world, and he's, you know, every time he hears about a bug, especially a stinging bug, uh, he goes looking for it. And in order to be stung by it? Well, I don't like pain. And right. So he says he's not trying to get stung, but it usually happens. And as far as he's concerned, that's a good thing. For example, I was petrified of this, the Seneca, which I call the warrior wasp. A Seneca is this uh, black wasp with this metallic sheen down in Central America. And they're known for this warning sound that they make with their nest. They have this big carton nest, carton being kind of paper. Kind of goes... Justin was there with another scientist, and they're tromping through the jungle. And then they find a nest. Here we are, this nest, and it starts to make that sound. Well, sure enough, we eventually got a kamikaze that came out and nailed me. Where, where did it sting you? Kind of on my forehead. And I just sort of sat on the stump and said, Ooh, this really hurts. It, it hurt like a yellow jacket or a hornet, but it was just a whole lot more. And it kept hurting for an hour. And so I, you know, recorded what the feeling was for this hour. So you're sitting there on a stump or something and your forehead is throbbing and you're taking notes? Well, what else can you do? He, he talks about getting stung by something that makes him hurts so much that he just starts screaming in pain for like an hour and lying on the ground because that'll make the pain less, I guess. And my left hand's sitting here shaking, it's trembling, you know, it's going up and down. And I said, oh, darn hand, stop that. And then with his other hand, he's taking notes about exactly <laughs> how it feels. And this left one's, you know, flapping away and I'm... In any case... How many times has he been stung? He told me he's been stung by like 150 species and probably about a thousand times. What? And he's used all those experiences to build up a scale. Which he could say is, is a five-point scale. Zero, one, two, three, and four. Zero being that's essentially trivial. And four being it really hurts. But wait, how does he deal with the whole subjectivity thing? Because, like, your four is going to be different than my four. He did something pretty clever, which is that he took one sting as, for reference, the honeybee which is, ouch, which I, you can talk about with anybody. Anybody's been stung by a honeybee. Yeah. It also doesn't hurt too much, and it doesn't hurt too little. So it's like a midpoint. Exactly. And, and a middle point, in this case, was easier than a top or a bottom, because I didn't know what the top or bottom was. There's no way to know what the top or the bottom is. So a honeybee was, was that, and so you give that a two. Two out of four. The prime meridian of pain. And every time he gets stung by a new bug, he'll ask himself, is it more than a honeybee, less than a honeybee, about the same as a honeybee, a whole lot more, a whole lot less. And then he gives that sting its own number. Dig this. 1.0, sweat bee, light, ephemeral, almost fruity. 1.8, the bullhorn acacia hand, a rare, piercing, elevated sort of thing. Someone has fired a staple into your cheek. 2.0, bald-faced hornet, rich, hearty, slightly crunchy, similar to getting your hand mashed in a revolving door. Ow. Three, red harvester, bold and unrelenting. Somebody's using a drill to excavate your ingrown toenail. This is his pain scale? Justin calls this his tongue-in-cheek version. That was a little more fun. But yeah, these are some of the things that he's measured. And what's the, uh, what's the worst? What's the top of the scale? Uh, the bullet end. It sends excruciating waves of burning pain that are undiminished for 12 hours. And you get these pulsations. You get this, this pain crescendo that goes to you just about wanting to scream. That backs off a little bit and says, ah, oh, you got to give it a little bit of a sigh of relief. And then it ascends back up and it keeps doing this, these hills and valleys of, of ascending pain and then decreasing. Even the decreasing to the lowest still hurts. So this scale uh, works for him? I mean, he uses it to communicate with bug scientists? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well all right. That's kind of cool, but... 
I, I gotta be honest. I, I, this is I'm wanting more right now because I uh, I like the scale, but I'm thinking actually beyond bugs to like. Let me just put my cards on the table. Like childbirth, okay? Like when we talk about like oh. the gap. Okay, I know. But we talk about the gap between like uh, two people feeling pain and being able to share pain. That's where the rubber meets the road. Well, it's used in a lot of marriages as a constant. You don't know. You don't know what... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Right. Does Tamar use it the way um, Carla uses it? Well, I, I can't say that in, in a recording. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, really, never. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Carla, I don't cross my mind. Carla, who's a very sort of understating lady, when it comes to this subject, she'll be like, you have no idea. <laughs> you don't even begin to know what you don't know about what we just went through. Well, that brings me to my second story. <clears throat> can I... Can I take it from the top for this one we go back a few years so we're in 1948 uh, who is this lady this is paula michaels uh, she's a professor of the history of medicine i teach at the university of iowa and she told me the story that takes place in new york at new york hospital in 1948 right so there's james d hardy there's carl t javert hardy and javert doctors and they're trying to test drugs you know what drugs are going to be useful to alleviate the pain of childbirth and in this period there's a whole range of things that are being used what are some of the ones that they're using well like morphine and scopolamine um demerol is a big thing nice um and heroin which to me sounds completely crazy <laughs> they play around with crack too <laughs> they, they would have if they knew about it the problem is they want to be able to test all these drugs so that they can use them in a standard way mm -hmm. But they weren't actually sure how much pain women were really in. And I guess you kind of have to know that in order to know how much drugs to give. Yeah, they had no idea, and it was a source of a lot of debate. Yes. One man, Grantley Dick Reed, a British physician, basically said straight out, it's in women's minds, not their bodies. What? Childbirth is a completely painless experience, entirely psychological in origin. Wow, that is a incredibly bold thing for a man to say. Yes, that's chutzpah. Now, Hardy and Javert didn't take it that far, but they wanted to get past the whole messy psychological part of childbirth. And eliminate that woman's subjective experience of pain from the calculation of whether these drugs are effective or not. And, and, and how are they going to do this? Well, their method is pretty crazy. They had this apparatus called a dolorometer. It was this little wood box that had dials and knobs plugged into the wall and then was connected by a wire to another part. What they called the exposure unit. That was like a heat gun with an aperture that can shoot out heat. Then they got some volunteers. Some of them were nurses. Mm -hmm. Some of them were the wives of obstetricians or other physicians. All very pregnant. And they told these women, this might not be very pleasant, but by participating, you're going to be making childbirth just so much better for every woman to follow. That's right. And the women were excited to help. And then when the woman went into labor... Hardy and Javert would show up bedside with the dolorometer, and they'd wait for the contraction to finish. And then between contractions... During that pause, they take the heat gun and they put it against the back of the woman's hand. And they say to her, all right, we want to know about that contraction. The one you just had. Yeah. We want to know how much it hurt. They'd say, is it more like A or more like B? And then the woman would respond. Because B is closer. And then they would say, is it more like B or more like C? C? Maybe. That was a way of then saying, okay, well, that was a contraction of three doles. Doles. What's a dole? The dole is their unit of pain, their, their standard unit that they use for everybody. And so over the course of labor, after every contraction, they would repeat this process. The same girl. Is it more like A or more like B? Again. A, B. And again. B or more like C. And again. Over the course of her whole labor. So wait, on top of all the labor pains, they're just cranking this heat up and up? Yeah. Wow. In the case of one patient who insisted on going the distance. A uh, pain intensity of ten and a half doles was measured. Hardy and Javert called this the ceiling. 
This is the most intense pain which can be experienced. Second degree burns were inflicted upon the hands of this patient by the four tests made at levels higher than nine dolls. Second degree burns. Yeah. I mean, I like what these guys are trying to do, but wow, that is sadistic. It seems totally twisted, but it's in the name of science. It's for a greater good. Uh, um, okay. All right, so then the doctors, they took all of the data from all of the women, and they start going through it, looking for patterns, looking for things in common. And then the most incredible part to me is that they converted all that information into a mathematical formula. Doles of pain equals 10.5 minus 1.5 times contraction intervals in minutes. What? Well, so they're saying if you tell us the amount of time between the contractions at any point in our labor, we can tell you exactly how much pain the woman is in. No more mystery. There's no more wondering. <laughs> Problem solved. The code is cracked. And, and what happens? Uh, does this uh, breakthrough sweep the medical establishment? I'm guessing it doesn't. Well, no. Other people could not achieve the same results that they achieved using the DeLong. <laughs> I don't know why I can't DeLong. Dolorometer. <laughs> using the Dolorometer, they were not able to achieve the same results. When other doctors tried to do it, the formula didn't seem to apply to the women that they looked at. Shocker. Obviously, there's a lot of problems with the entire approach that these guys had. Right? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for starters, they were trying to compare pain in the abdomen to... You know, like a burning sensation on the arm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, like, that's like a translation problem. Yeah, well, I mean, in my opinion, there's a kind of a bigger translation issue happening, which is, in order to talk about a pain you're feeling, you need to be able to observe it and, and kind of stand apart from it in your own head, if that makes sense. Sure. And when you hear women talk about the pain of childbirth... Hello, my name is Sarah. I'm in Sacramento, California. We ask people to submit theirs through the Radiolab app. And when you listen to these different accounts... My experience of childbirth pain was... Um, it sounds like there's a certain point where everything shifts. And one woman said it was a bit about, like, about seven, seven centimeters, centimeters dilated. dilated. And that's when you like, lose your mind. And you can't think, you can't talk. And suddenly the pain becomes so, so great. So bad. But there's no more reference point. I just remember... There's no more objective distance. Making these noises that were just... <laughs> unearthly and in these submissions it's usually at this point in the story where the woman either just I, I, oh. draws a blank wow or resorts to some crazy analogy it felt like there was a freight train bearing down on my vagina from inside my body and that I could almost hear it building I felt like I was being dragged out to sea. That's when I actually heard a couple times. Waves. Waves of pain. And it was kind of like that for, for Paula, too. I turned very much inward in a way that, that made time feel like it stopped. I was drowning. Drowning in this lake of pain and there was a horizon and when the contractions were intense i would swim towards the horizon this is our third pain calibrator eula i'm eula biss i'm a nonfiction writer i came across a great essay that she wrote called the pain scale and for me eula kind of comes closest to finding a way to communicate pain if if i could say you have a relationship with pain mm -hmm. uh when did that when did that start for you Let's see, about almost 10 years ago. I think I was about 26. At the time, Eula was a grad student in Iowa. And uh, I just woke up one morning in the fall and I had a terrible pain in the side of my neck, upper back, side of my face. She had no idea what it was. It was a burning pain. With this nauseating, tingling sensation. I've really never felt anything else like it. In months past, and it didn't go away, and it was making it very difficult for me to sleep. Yeah. It started to interfere with my thinking, too. I couldn't concentrate. 
So one day she went to the hospital and by this point she was a total mess. So I was kind of teary and shaking and I said, you, you need to give me something to help me with this. And so the doc said, all right, well, uh, take a look at this thing up here on the wall. This is called the pain scale. It had the numbers zero to 10. Mm -hmm. At one end it said no pain. At the other end it said the worst pain imaginable. Mm -hmm. And the doctor says to her, okay, what number is your pain? Eula starts to think about it. The worst pain imaginable is kind of vague. Is this the worst pain you yourself can imagine? Or is it the worst pain imaginable on earth? Hmm. You know, this was around the time that I think a man had died being dragged behind a truck in Texas. And I, uh, I remember yeah. sitting in the exam room thinking about that. And then I was trying to do some <clears throat> rudimentary mathematics. If being dragged behind a truck to your death is the worst pain imaginable, what, what proportion of that do I feel? And I thought, you know, a third of that seemed pretty significant to me. So she says three, I guess. Then the doc's like, all right, and he does some tests. He tries to figure out exactly what's going on. Can't really, but since she said three anyway, he's like, all right, well, you know, have some aspirin, go home. And this happened a few times. She wasn't getting any better. So at a certain point, she calls up her dad, who's also a doctor, and she starts complaining. I was telling him how frustrated I was that, um, that the doctors didn't seem to be taking this very seriously. And he said, well, when they ask you to rate your pain, what, what do you tell them? <clears throat> and I said, I usually say three. And he said, well, there's your problem. <laughs> her dad tells her, you should say eight. Even if you're not feeling it, that's what you got to say. And Yula thinks, you know, this is ridiculous. Why do we even have a pain scale if I'm not supposed to take the number seriously? And um, he said, in part, it's a tool that's meant to protect practitioners because it's emotionally difficult to have someone say to you, um, it feels like someone's jamming a red hot poker through my eyeball rather than I've got a nine. But then he made a suggestion, which I think is really clever. He suggested one scale where it would measure what you're willing to do to get rid of your pain. What would you trade for pain relief? Would you give up your sense of sight for five years would you relinquish your ability to walk did you come up with any answers at that point i did I, I, they were disturbing answers you know when my father asked would you accept a shorter lifespan at that point in time i thought yeah i would uh, how many years i was thinking i'd take 10 years off my life wow for me that was basically the first time I felt like I understood her pain. But, you know, I was 26, and <laughs> <laughs> life seems really long when you're 26. Now, I'm in a much different space. M my pain is not nearly as bad as it was then, so now I'm not really in the bargaining mood anymore. I bet, like, how about a bad haircut? Would you take a really bad haircut? <laughs> a mohawk. Huh. Okay. Yeah, actually I would. <laughs> and these days, Yula is kind of pessimistic about the idea that we're ever going to really have a useful pain scale. At the end of the day, I'm not sure pain is a quantity that is measurable. Thinking that kind of bums her out. Because part of me wanted to believe in the project of quantification. Why? I, I'm not sure. Um, I think because not believing in it is a little bit lonelier. The idea that we cannot feel, cannot understand, and cannot imagine each other's pain is a really isolating thought. By the way, what was her pain from? Did she get a diagnosis? Well, her doctor tried a lot of stuff, actually. They did a brain scan, they checked for a spinal infection. And uh, ultimately... He said, you know, unfortunately, we, we don't know what causes this. We don't know how to treat it. We don't know if it will ever get better. Um, but we do know it's real. <laughs> and that was my final conversation with him. And he said, um, good luck out there. Tim 
Howard, Justin Schmidt, Paula Michaels, and Eula Biss. I'm Robert Krilwich. I'm Jen Evelrod. And we'll be right back. Miss. Hi, guys. I just called, and I think I messed up, so I want to try it again. Okay? Okay. Hi, this is Studies. I am a Radio Lab listener in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts, and here are the credits. Radio Lab is supported in part by the National Science Foundation and by the Alfred B. Sloan Foundation, enhancing public understanding of science and technology in the modern world. More information about Sloan at www.sloan.org. I think that one was better. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Hi, I'm Robert Krilwich. Radio Lab is supported by Zip Recruiter. When you're hiring, posting your job on one site, one measly site, is not enough. So where do you go to find top talent? With Zip Recruiter, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites, 100 plus, with just one click. Let Zip Recruiter's powerful technology match your job to the right candidates and use their simple dashboard to find your perfect hire. They say that over 80% of the jobs on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. So try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Radiolab. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Radiolab. This is Dale Boyd calling from Penticton, British Columbia, Canada. Radiolab is supported by Capital One. A good credit score can keep your mind at peace, and that's why you work hard making smart financial decisions at every point. So don't let up now. Keep your credit strong with the CreditWise app from Capital One. With CreditWise, you can keep an eye on your TransUnion credit score, get alerts each time your credit is pulled and when your credit report changes. And the best part? It's free for everyone. So whether you're a Capital One customer or not, download the free CreditWise app today and find a state of credit enlightenment. Hey, I'm Jad Abumrad. I'm Robert Krolwich. This is Radio Lab. And today we're talking about the things we know we cannot ever know. But we want to know them. We want to know them. And, you know, the, where this impulse gets very tricky is around the question of empathy, particularly in the sciences. Like, if you're a scientist and you're studying something, like a creature, is it right to think you can empathize with that thing? Is that the right approach, the human approach, or is that arrogant? And in our next story, that becomes a very sticky point for one particular scientist comes to us from one of our favorite producers, Lulu Miller. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, award-winning author, <laughs> fantastic husband. Uh, Dad of the year. Dad of the year. No, I'm Jeff Lockwood. I'm a uh, professor at the University of Wyoming. I'm Jeff here. is an entomologist. You like a bug guy? He's a bug guy, and mostly he studies crickets and grasshoppers. And this story involves a kind of cricket that's well different. The gorillas. <laughs> yeah, the gorilla critters, yeah. And are they related to Katie Dids? The way to think of a gorilla critter is like a, a cricket on steroids. Okay. Sort of like the Hulk Hogan of crickets. First of all, he says they're a little bulkier than your average cricket. And they tend to have very strong jaws. Very strong jaws. And mandibles that are really sharp. Sort of like a serrated knife. And most of all, they're Vicious. They all had to be caged separately. If you put them together, they would they would fight. To the death? Yeah. Wow. And so when I would go in in the mornings... And reach into one of their cages, as soon as they saw him coming, they'd fly into this... Rage. It's really sort of a showstopper. They'll sort of rear up on their hind legs. Beat their abdomens on the ground. Flare out their wings. And then clamp onto his fingers. They would draw blood. Whoa. Wow. So I used this uh, this glass probe on, on, on the big boy, uh, at least until the point at which he snapped off the end of the glass rod. Holy moly. So the point is, these creatures were completely alien to him. There's, like, nothing about them he can relate to. But over time, the more he studied them, the more he started noticing things that made them seem way less foreign. Because, see, I kept these in, in these... For example, as soon as he put one into a new cage, it would make itself a little nest. And once it has that little nest built, that's home. In a very real way. Because by moving them around to different cages, he soon realized... That they could differentiate their, their nests. They can actually tell the difference between their nest and another. Wait, how do they do that? They secrete a pheromone, a chemical... And each cricket is able to self-identify its own odor. Whoa. It gave me the sense, and I think there's something to this, that they had a kind of capacity 
to recognize self. Oh, interesting. Um, we don't see that much in insects, but they had uh, what appears to be a capacity to say, this is mine. And then he began to think differently about that crazy rage, too. Because if, if you think about it, here's this creature completely vulnerable to attack. They really don't have a very good defense for themselves. They don't excrete nasty chemicals. They don't sting. They can't fly, so it's not going to go flying away either. So maybe that rage is their only strategy. Which, again, drew me into thinking that I understood them. Perhaps these little guys were... More like me than, than many other insects that I had worked with. So he grew to really like them. But then, one day... Well, I'd been working with this particular gorilla critted. Trying to move him from one cage to another. And he was agitated and had decided to go on the offensive, which involved trying to come out of the cage. So he was scrambling up the side of the cage. And to keep him from getting out, Jeff slammed the lid down. As he was just at the edge. And caught him between the lid and the edge of the cage. And I, you know, quickly lifted the lid up and he fell back into the cage. And I looked down at him. And uh, what had happened was I had ruptured his abdomen. A split right down his belly. Jeez. And some of the, um, the viscera um, and, and the kind of globule of, of yellow fat that was leaking out, um, oozing out of his body. I, I felt guilt and then, of course, I, I felt sorry for an animal. What really struck me was what he did next, which was curl his head downward uh, toward his abdomen, pause for a moment, uh, and then began consuming his own innards. Consuming the viscera that, that, that was oozing out of his body. Um, and so he was, he was literally cannibalizing himself. Wow, that is disgusting. It was horrifying. Um, I had sort of felt like I come to, I had come to know them. Yeah. Then this, this was just so out of the imaginable. But the instant that word popped into his mind, unimaginable, he had this sort of Pavlovian reflex, and he thought of this guy, an old professor of his, Dr. Lafage. Lafage. He was one of my mentors at uh, Louisiana State University. This was a teacher of his? Yep, insect behavior. He was one of the younger faculty members uh, when I was there, mid-30s. Slight of build, but incredibly intense. He's kind of an expert in animal violence. And the thing he harped on over and over, the thing he was trying to pound into their brains was... Objectivity. To separate one's emotions and interests from the object of study and uh he had these wire rim glasses and i and i remember if uh, if uh, if he would ask you a question like why does the gorilla critic do its crazy war dance and you tried sort of reading in will intention mental states maybe because it's angry or scared he would just drop his chin and look over the top and tear you apart his job in the classroom was to make us good objective observers and jeff Jeff stayed in touch with him over the years. I wanted to be good at this. As he set up his own lab. You know, I, I, I had a, a stake in, in, in earning his respect. And so that day, as he's watching the gorilla critic consume its own guts, he's thinking, okay, what would Lafage see in this? So my, my sense in my research is that what this gorilla critic had done was perhaps to have detected the odor of its own fats. It sort of drew the conclusion that this must be something good to eat without sort of grasping that it was its its own self. The smell of its own fat triggered a feeding behavior that, that's highly adaptive. Um, you know, to feed on fat. Fats are very hard to get hold of out in the world. And so when you smell fats, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's like us and donuts, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, go for it. It triggers feeding, yeah. It triggers feeding. So clearly these things don't quite have a sense of self. Right, so, so maybe they're not just like me. Which is always Lafage's point. Don't put the creature in your box. It doesn't want to be there. It's sort of a moral danger almost to sort of not allow the organism to be what it is. Mm. It, it's almost to sort of possess it or to own it and to really treat the insects sort of with a, with a, with, with a deep respect, right, is oddly yeah. enough to treat them objectively. You know, he, he was one of the, one of the professors who actually engendered a, a, a kind of 
a good fear. And he was the kind of person who you, uh, who you wanted to please. <laughs> Is that better? Um, a little louder? Yeah, louder. Like a tiny bit. Is that okay? Oh, that's great. Great, okay. great. But then, years later, something happened that challenged Jeff's ability to do this. To be the kind of scientist that Lafage wanted him to be. We're recording over here? And there's really only one person who can tell us this part of the story. Will you um, introduce yourself? Okay. My name is Tamara Carboni. Tamara is actually not a scientist. She worked for the Louisiana State Museum. And back in 1989, she and Dr. Lafage, whose first name is also Jeff, were working together on this termite problem. The termites were getting really bad in the French Quarter, and it was her job to preserve the historic homes and... Jeff was studying the termites. I never imagined that I would be fascinated by termites, but I was. <laughs> so he made it fascinating. Yeah, fascinating. But then one night in July, July 25th, they met for dinner to talk about how the project was going. And um, we were walking home. Uh, well, he was walking me to my house around 10, 1030 at night. And I think it must have been raining or there was a threat of rain because Jeff was carrying an umbrella and I could hear footsteps behind us very determined sounding footsteps and um, we got to a corner across from my house and at that point this person came around us in front of us and he said close your eyes and in the process of closing my eyes I saw the gun so she closed her eyes and a second later she felt a tug on her purse I could feel him take hold of the straps and I was not going to resist and as I felt him do that I could hear Jeff say don't do that at that instant felt Jeff move and I guess at that point I opened my eyes this guy had already run never took my purse I saw Jeff running toward my house and I just ran after him I had no idea he was shot but he got onto the porch and he collapsed on his back and at that point he was gushing blood And I was trying to get Jeff to understand that help was coming. And I kept saying, um, you're going to be okay. They're on their way. And did he say anything? He couldn't talk. He just he had this kind of stare. And I just watched him die. The news came by a phone call. And it just seemed, you know, it was, you know, just, you know, one of those those classic unreal moments. Something about this, you know, must be wrong. It wasn't Dr. Lafarge. He wasn't really killed. It seemed particularly hard to grasp. You know, one minute I'm with this vital person, and the next minute he's dead. Sadness, anguish, confusion. It was hysterical, crying. I was in shock. They never found his killer. Never found out anything about him who he was, why he would do this. It was just this seemingly senseless act. And that's how Jeff understood it for years, that it was senseless. senseless. But over time, something odd started to happen. Like with those gorilla critted, Lafage started appearing in his brain, senseless. Senseless. telling him that that word wasn't good enough. And he began to ask himself again, how would Dr. Lafarge want me to think about this? How would he think about his own death? Okay, so I wonder if, if you do have the essay with you. Um, so he writes an essay. Will you read the last four paragraphs of, of the essay? Uh, I will. One, two, three, four, right. The year after I left Louisiana and came to Wyoming as a freshly minted PhD. The first thing he does is he takes Lafarge's attitude 
on violence. The violence is the baseline strategy for most encounters between and indeed within species. That it's not some evil outlying thing, but instead a baseline strategy for all animals. And in that light, he looks at the actions of that night sort of dispassionately. For most humans, first he figures this kid was probably mugging them because he was poor. Hopeless, poor, angry, scared. The woman became tangled in the strap. Dr. Lafage, having his own instinctual reaction, stepped between them. So don't hurt her. You, you can have the purse. I can picture him doing this. But perhaps that action itself scared the kid. The young man drew a gun and fired point blank. We showed the essay to Tamara. Yeah, well, no, that's not. I mean, I don't think, and I don't know if he stepped forward or not. You know, again, my eyes were closed. I could feel some kind of movement. I certainly don't think he stepped between. He, there wasn't enough space for him to step between us. For Tamara, who's been over the event a million times in her head, and, yeah. it doesn't add up so easily. First of all, when Dr. Lafage spoke to the kid, it wasn't exactly a command. It was more like, don't do that. It was like, don't be an idiot. Don't do that. It wasn't really threatening. It was more like, look, logically, let's not do this. And while she gets that the kid might have been scared and had not been intending to shoot, if he never, ever could imagine himself shooting somebody, he wouldn't have had a loaded gun. I can't relate to this person. I can't imagine doing violence to another human being or killing them. Um, I can't relate to that at all. And over the years, her friends and family, co-workers, tried all different kinds of ways to help her make sense of it. Nothing really helped, but... There was someone that I worked with, my boss actually, who had been in Vietnam, and he took me aside and he said, you know, you'll never understand this. You're not going to understand it. Yeah. Like, don't even try? I don't think there's any sense to be made out of it. If we just stop there, then it, it's to say that, that it's somehow... Um, unnatural or inhuman and in fact in a weird kind of way it's profoundly human there's no way i can understand it and in the end the essay itself kind of falls short and jeff admits that it just isn't sufficient but he says there is a way of understanding this event he just hasn't gotten there yet but it is out there yeah it has to be and dr lafage would have i think said this as well for the moment. I think I can say that I I understand uh, another being's eating its own leaking entrails um, at, a, at a level that I can't understand one of my fellow beings um, you know, pulling the trigger and, uh, and, 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 and killing a man that I love. when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash radiolab. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, and mlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Hi, I'm Robert Krolovich, and Radiolab is supported by Blue Apron. 
Blue Apron partners with sustainable farms, fisheries, and ranchers to bring you all the ingredients you need to create incredible home-cooked meals. Ingredients come paired with an easy-to-follow recipe card delivered to your door weekly in a refrigerated box. Rediscover how fun cooking can be while enjoying specialty ingredients and exploring new flavors and cuisines. Get your first three Blue Apron meals free plus free shipping by visiting blueapron.com slash Radiolab. Hey, I'm Jad Abumrad. I'm Robert Krulwich. This is Radiolab. And today, stories of known unknowns. Things we really want to know, but we know we can't know, but we still we try because we need to know it even though we know we can't. And to switch gears ever so slightly here... I was trying to think where I have seen the most intense, almost, you know, literally theatrical uncertainty. And, I, and, and there happens to... I don't know, do, you, wait, do you know, do you like improvisational comedy? I, have a, I, I would like to be, but it's, <laughs> if, if the experience of watching improv makes me uncomfortable. Well, that's the thing. I'm going to introduce you to two guys who do something very interesting with that discomfort. Because if you talk to, to true comedy nerds, they will tell you there are two individuals who take this improvisational dare further than anybody else. Hello. Hello, TJ and Dave. Yep. David Pesquese and TJ Jagodowski. This is, this is us. And this is Robert. Hi, Robert. Hi, Robert. This, our producer, Sean Cole, and I called them up because we've been to their shows. And, uh, you have two fans here. Well, thank you, guys. Yeah. Jeez. I've gone with my wife, with my sister. Wow. I've gone with people who went, couldn't stand it because they thought it was like so scary to them. <laughs> <laughs> and one friend actually wanted to bolt, and I had to like, hold his hand, his leg down on the chair. Yeah. That's a common reaction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so what, what do these guys do? It's so special. Well, in normal improvisation, people come onto the stage and they ask for some. Like, What's our? You're at a party. And then you you've got a a French teacher. You know, you go, and then they, they have do, to make up a scene about yeah that scenario. And yeah. then and then it lasts for five minutes or so. Right. Well, these guys, they don't do that at all. Thank you very much. They get up on stage. This is TJ Jagodowski. They introduce themselves. We are super happy to be here as we hail from Chicago. They do a little crowd work back and forth with the audience. We're very much looking forward to improvising for you. Trust us, this is all made up. But then, boom. Lights go out. And when the lights come back up, there's two guys on stage just looking at each other. And it looks like they've just suddenly woken up and have no idea who they are. No, no. They don't know if they're a man or a woman. No, not yet. Where they are. Correct. When they are. No assumptions. We're completely tabula rasa. From the very beginning, it's understood that we're all just going to find out together. Right. And here's the thing. This is going to last unbroken for the next 50 years. Minutes. It's like a one-act play with characters and plot, and they can't stop, can't break, and they have no idea what they're about to do. None. So wait, if they're if they have no script, they have no plan, they got nothing, they don't even know who they are. And how do you even begin? Well, I, I tell you what it looks like. They just stand there and look at each other until. We'll bounce back, man. One of them speaks. We'll bounce back. And then it's on. I don't want to get into it. Yeah, you'll bounce oh, back. <laughs> Tough day. At this point, what do you know? All I know is we're friends. We're in some sort of indoor setting. I think it looked like that. Males. Uh, males. Breathe it out. Breathe through it. <laughs> is that what they say? Breathe through it. Peers. So breathe into the area that's bringing you breathe the into it. Yeah. yeah, breathe into it, man. <laughs> one, of the, is one of the guys upset. Something's just happened. You can hear some that's screaming from out here. I don't know, some kind of thing. Yeah, look, you know, I say what I need to say. Yeah, that's absolutely. what I do. When it happens, you know what happens if you keep it in? You keep it in? Yeah. Cancer. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like Jackie Robinson. Yeah, right. All right, so some kind of fight just happened. Yeah, one of these guys, he right. is feeling yeah. like he just lost. Yep. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know who we are yet, but they gotta keep going. Did he look? Did he, did he look like stunned? Did you get? Yeah, I mean, I got it. Yeah, there was a, at first, but you know, at first, you know, you know, just fighting. Was for the boss. Well, we were all rooting for you Thanks. out here. Thanks. Their boss. 
Yeah, we'll see what the fallout is. Okay, uh -oh. now we know it's a corporate environment without decent leadership. We got no leadership. No, yeah, we got yeah. no leadership. Yeah, a little top heavy, if you yeah. ask me. And then they a little resent top heavy. heavy. Yeah, a little top heavy. All right, so two guys complaining about a boss. Yeah, but right at that moment, they both shout in the same direction. So the geography of this setting kind of crystallizes, because now we know that the boss's office is off to the right. Yeah, there are facts that are revealing themselves now, literally, you know, blueprints. Yeah, you know what, because you got to ask yourself, you want the job or you want the story? <laughs> yep. But uh, we still don't know where it's going. I'm fine, I'm going to be fine. Yeah, Whatever you'd be happens, great. I'm you'd be, be an fine. asset to any corporation or company. I don't know, know about that. Yeah, I do. That's nice of you to say. It was heroic, you know. It was like you were riding into battle for everybody. But then, there comes a moment. You wore, you brought the banner in there. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. Hey, you know what? If you don't stand, you know, because you'll fall for anything. Right. 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 That's right. You know what? And I know it's a softball team. There. But we start somewhere. We start somewhere. We'll start somewhere. You know, fight if I want. Yeah, well, he's going to play shortstop because he's a f no. district manager. Right. So I can think, huh? There is a little bit of an exhale of like, all right. Well, now we know that. That that does make sense with the things we have seen up up till now, <laughs> and also that I think the delight in, oh wow, it's been that all along, right, right. Because we're just paying attention to what happened since the lights went up. Right. Nothing else exists. Right. So one of the things that happened since the lights went up is when I mentioned something about cancer. Yeah. Cancer. Right. Yeah. yeah. TJ said Jackie Robinson. Like Jackie yeah. Robinson. So yeah. that that went in my brain. And Dave says the only way you're going to get these kinds of moments, which are both surprising and obvious at the very same time, is if the performers are genuinely as surprised at what just happened as the audience. And the only way that can happen is if we actually don't know it. Um, and so the not knowing is where the that's the goal. But, I mean, you, I assume you have the usual amount of self-loathing that most people have. So Probably what, more. So why are you afraid that you will look for this story between you and nothing will occur. Please don't bring up this question. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a constant fear? Yes, absolutely. TJ says... Uh, before the show begins, there is an absolute, like, maelstrom going on in inside me personally. But here's the truly fascinating thing. The way they deal with that maelstrom, all that anxiety about what's going to happen, is they tell themselves this story. That this thing that they're creating, they don't actually create it. They don't make it happen. It's already happening. Without them. It's all already going on. That's, it's not our job to make it. It's already going on. What? All right, so you know the moment they mentioned at the beginning when the, when the lights go dim and they're standing just about to begin? Yeah. They'd say at that moment, the stage is literally swirling with all these characters. Billions and billions. Billions of hits. Billions of stories going on. And the moment the lights come up, one of those stories gets frozen in place and they just step in. We... Here's how TJ describes it in a documentary. Believe that there's this thing going on, that, that the show is already going on. This It is already in process, and we pick it up at a moment somewhere within this progression, but that the show itself started a long time ago. Um, we, we didn't know it, and we don't know which show we're about to join already in progress. So we get to live it or physically represent it for 50 some odd minutes and then we leave it but it keeps on going that the people that were represented for that amount of time go on to have marriages and divorces and children and buy property and maybe die a natural death a long time in the future or die in some horrible accident <laughs> soon after soon after we we see them To think of the show as it's already all set and all I have to do is stay out of the way takes a huge pressure off of having, I'm, I, I'm not a determining active part in this, I'm along for this 
excellent ride that's already excellent with a friend of mine if I just listen and pay attention to him and what the show is doing. And, and do you actually believe that that the show is already going on before you get there and everything like that, or is that just... Is that a, is that a story that you tell yourself, or is that more of a... Uh, that is an excellent question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I don't know the answer. Really? I, yeah, I don't know if uh, uh, I, I don't know if if it's going on before or after. I'm not sure of that. But I do know that right now this is happening, and it and it's not our of our making. Just so you know, over the course of the hour, they start playing all kinds of different characters. The show expands, expands. You meet co-workers. Have you been here the whole time? <laughs> Is that a, a cult? Eventually you meet the boss, and then the workers discover that the boss has been intentionally throwing... Was throwing? Softball games. Contest. Because they're playing clients, they don't want to embarrass them. We're throwing games? Not always. We're bowing down? Sometimes. Taking it up to Fanny from Cottonelle because you need their business? <laughs> So the workers had just schemed to kidnap the boss. So maybe tie him up and put him in a van. So they can finally win a game. So he can't show up at the game and screw up the batting order and things like that. Just, yeah, it just keeps going on from there. You just respond honestly in these tiny moments. One little thing onto the next little thing. It's that step off the platform before the next piece of floor comes to be under that foot. It's like, it's like a beautiful dare, sort of the whole thing. <laughs> it sounds like you're talking both about life and about the show as a beautiful day. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, our, our tendency is to take what you guys do and transpose it onto other things. Do you do you think do you do that? Do you think how we perform is how people or how we should live, or does that seem silly? Oh, uh, it seems silly, and I agree with it. Hmm. I I do know that when I can get you know in the real world closer to the idea of what I do and I improvise, I know I have better days. When, when I don't presuppose too much, try and predetermine too much, when I am taking things as they come in the moment, I know I'm living a less anxious life. And when they're up there on the stage, in the lights, by themselves, with no plan... But it's the most, uh, it's the best hour all, all week. So... He's still, he's still in his office. At large, he's still at large. Yeah, yeah, he's loose. <laughs> it's just so encompassing. There's no more calm place in in the world than than the quiet of doing that show with David at, at that time. Maybe we don't mean, need to make that many changes. Maybe we just do better. <laughs> You too. Big thanks to producer Sean Cole and of course to TJ and Dave, to Alex Karpowski, whose documentary we quoted briefly from. It's called Trust Us, This Is All Made Up. And to Harrison George. And to you for listening. I'm Jada Boomrod. I'm Robert Krulwich. We'll see you next time. Sort of message. It's hell every time I hear that routine. And you guys changed it. Um, hi, it's Lulu. And I'm calling with the credits. Okay, so, Radio Lab is produced by Chad Abumrod. Our staff includes Ellen Horn, Norm Mueller, Pat Walters, Drew Howard, Brenna Farrell, Brenna, Brenna Farrell, Molly Webster, Melissa O'Donnell, Bill and O'Keefe, Lynn Levy, and Andy Mills. With help from Derek Clement and Shruti Pinamanini. Alright, bye. Hi, this is Brooke from Miami, Florida. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations and American Express. And from John and Catherine Debs in support of NPR's new global headquarters and production center in Washington, D.C. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation dedicated to the idea that all people deserve the chance to live healthy, productive lives at GatesFoundation.org and the Union of Concerned Scientists. Science for a healthy planet and a safer world. More at UCSUSA.org. Thanks and have an awesome day.